Welcome back, everybody. Um, I guess we can get started just in the interest of time. Um, we'll start the morning with a couple of talks on adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Dr. Javanan from uh, UC Davis um, will speak on three-dimensional correction techniques for thoracic scoliosis. Great, good morning, everyone. Um, so uh, my disclosures um, are in the um, pamphlet. So um, the topic of today is to review some of the planning um, and steps to uh, achieve good three-dimensional correction in uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, we'll talk about release and osteotomies, um, coronal and sagittal plane correction, and uh, very importantly, axial um, a plane correction, also known as direct vertebral rotation, and understand some of the tool and techniques where we could do this. I think it's important to have a, a historical uh, perspective on this. Uh, uh, in my opinion, we're changing rather quickly. If you look at the early 1900s from 1910 to the 50s, um, we had the advent of uh, Hibs um, doing uh, some of the first fusions and POTS disease uh, Ito doing anterior fusions, and um, also the turnbuckle cast, and uh, a lot of these uh, corrections were done with uh, releases osteotomies. Um, I actually recently uh, treated an adult patient who was uh, treated with uh, tibial strut grafts, um, and um, uh, she was placed in the cast for three months, um, and that's how she was treated. So uh, we still see these patients floating around. Um, um, Harrington in the 1960s um, came up with a, one of the first instrumentation uh, for a coronal plane uh, correction. Initially, he was infusing, and uh, John Moe in uh, Twin Cities, Minnesota, um, actually started uh, fusing patients with a Harrington rod instrumentation, and that kind of became a, um, a well-known technique. Um, it wasn't until uh, Luque um, brought his... Uh, sublaminar wire technique where you actually could grab onto multiple segments of the spine and you could see um, they uh, get very nice correction. You don't know what the pre-op look like, but um, they still had a lot of good correction uh, by segmentally capturing um, um, the spine. Um, we got better um, and for the first time really uh, derotation or uh, axial plane correction with the Cotrell Dubasset which include hooks and um, uniaxial or post-it type screws. Um, and there was a number of hook and pedicle screw uh, constructs. Uh, these were obviously very technically challenging to work with, uh, but um, the um, instrumentation was coming along uh, pretty well. Um, and then it wasn't um, until mid 80s where the Puno, Winter and Bird um, patented the first polyaxial pedicle screw, and um, Abba Bird and Randy Puno and Javadan Sr. were, were um, actually fellows together. They're still friends today. So a lot of the fellows that you guys are sitting by are going to be <laughs> lifelong friends um, uh, for you guys. Um, Sook um, really popularized the uh, thoracic pedicle screws um, and um, kind of brought us into the uh, modern uh, age uh, of uh, scoliosis correction with a uh, pedicle screw construct in the thoracic spine. Uh, and obviously, uh, the importance of the lanky classification, uh, where we paid attention to the sagittal plane for the first time and selective fusions. Um, and um, uh, in the 2000s, um, techniques in direct vertebral rotation are um, uh, become very popularized and um, a lot of systems incorporate that uh, into them. So why do we uh, use these modern techniques and what are the advantages? So pedicle uh, screw based dual rod um, with direct vertebral rotation gives us three dimensional plane correction. 
uh, allows us to get shorter fusion. Um, it really obviates the need for thoracoplasty. Um, so uh, I've, I really have not done one um, in uh, my own career, even though I did one with one of my mentors uh, in fellowship. Um, improved pulmonary function, and uh, that's uh, been uh, well documented uh, with pulmonary function tests. And uh, it mostly obviates the need for any anterior release, even for larger and stiffer curves. And we'll take a uh, look at that in some case examples. And obviously improved cosmesis. And uh, we had a great uh, discussion about improved cosmesis uh, regarding the rib hump, uh, trunk balance, and uh, shoulder balance. And uh, those, um, uh, even though um, <clears throat> might seem that they're just cosmetic, they, they become increasingly and incrementally more important, uh, especially uh, in the regions uh, that people might practice. So taking a look at a case um, to look at these techniques, this is a, a patient who's almost 14, has uh, um, never been treated with a brace. He was uh, uh, conservatively treated with a chiropractic, uh, with a chiropractor. It's a normal MRI, um, mild mid and uh, <clears throat> scapular pain. Uh, and uh, some right trunk shift. Um, so when we took a look at her flexibility x-rays, we see that it's a semi-flexible curve with uh, um, the uh, upper thoracic and the lumbar curve um, um, being considered flexible. Um, they are under 25 degrees. Um, so um, we determined uh, based on that and uh, the center sacral line and the last touch vertebra, um, <coughs> where uh, our proximal and distal levels would be. Um, we're not gonna get too much into shoulder balance, but in general, a left shoulder low T4 is a, uh, is a good place to be. Uh, T3 if they're level and uh, if the left shoulder's higher, maybe T2. And um, we um, try to not go to uh, T2 a lot in, uh, in our institution. Um, so T3 is a favored um, level for a curve like this, even though you probably are a little bit better off leveling the shoulders if you go just a little bit higher. Um, LIV over here are, would be L3. Um, and then um, other um, considerations for osteotomy grade. So we uh, routinely do uh, posterior column osteotomies. We've been doing this more aggressively in multiple levels. But um, you know they're kind of like a grade one and a half, so uh, we haven't been doing the uh, superior articular facet um, uh, release completely as it gives you a little bit potential for uh, neurologic changes and uh, bleeding. And, um, and I'll show you in the technique, um, after a little while, we decided that we don't need this. Um, so we do use um, a halo femoral uh, traction for the larger curves. Uh, I put... Uh, um, uh, uh, just head traction uh, for medium-sized curves, and we published on this. This probably makes our um, uh, releases uh, and um, our surgical time uh, a little bit better. So in uh, correcting in three dimension, um, obviously we're going to correct um, in the coronal plane, um, balance the trunk to uh, midline. Uh, in the sagittal plane, it's very important to um, uh, maintain um, and create kyphosis. Um, and uh, again, it's important to um, <clears throat> touch on the fact that most scoliosis, AS scoliosis, is a lordo scoliosis. There is hypokyphosis. So we're um, really trying to create um, more kyphosis. And that's going to be, become very important because there's going to be a compensatory creation of uh, lumbar lordosis, even though we're not fusing that portion. Um, and um, that's been um, well documented. Um, Peter Newton had a great paper showing that the uh, x-ray measurements in two dimension underestimates the loss of kyphosis. So even though you um, measure a patient and they only have 20 degrees of kyphosis on a lateral x-ray, you're, you're sure that they're hypokyphotic. They're actually more hypokyphotic. They could be almost uh, lordotic sometimes um, because of the rotational aspect. Um, and uh, again, uh, uh, Newton's group showed that the importance of maintaining to, and creating um, thoracic kyphosis and how that uh, plays with the uh, lumbar. Um, and also, uh, very importantly, when you rotate um, the rib um, the rib cage and uh, restore that anatomy. Improvements in absolute and uh, uh, percent predicted uh, pulmonary function tests at two years are um, evident. 
So some classic cor correction techniques, and there are more, but I just list a few. Obviously, translation um, of the um, concave um, portion of the spine to midline. Uh, there is a rod rotation um, technique, and um, also differential bending with uh, putting more um, <clears throat> bend into your concavity or concave side. Um, however, these techniques are not usually just used in isolation. They're essentially a combination of these techniques that are used uh, simultaneously. And uh, we can see this in a case example again. Uh, and axial uh, or direct vertebral rotation um, is, uh, becomes very important for uh, getting the um, rib hump um, down and um, also recreating the uh, normal anatomy of the chest cavity. And um, in my opinion, uh, use of um, uniplanar screws is very important in this. And there are uh, different thoughts and constructs for this, but I've kind of become a, someone that uses almost all uh, unis, um, um, except for um, maybe a special occasions. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna take you through some of the um, intra-op um, uh, photographs and uh, videos of uh, how we do this. Um, I always uh, color the fascia. It's a very uh, simple trick, uh, but um, the fellows uh, seem to like it so um, and um, adopt it throughout the years when I talk to them afterwards. Uh, so I use a purple marker to color it, and uh, you are able to uh, close it really well, and uh, you always get very uh, uh, good uh, layered closure. Um, and we've been doing the osteotomy with an ultrasonic um, uh, type uh, scalpel and um, just going right across and doing it in one step. Uh, and after the release, um, we um, um, take the set fragments out for bone graft. Um, I have a video over here so we could see a little bit closer. So in the, <clears throat> we pretty much cut pars to pars and um, after, um, um, teaching the fellows how to do this. They could do this very safely and efficiently, and um, it uh, seems to decrease uh, blood loss um, and um, do, it would be kind of facile when we're doing it in surgery. After that, we um, quickly uh, release the fragments if they're not completely relaxed, and usually they actually pop off when the patient's in traction pretty well. And um, again, we uh, either use the rongeurs and curettes and um, remove the and release the spine. Uh, and at this point, usually a little bit of the ligamentum flavum um, also uh, comes off. So we don't really have to do any further um, releases. And uh, rarely um, I uh, do complete ponte, maybe at the uh, apex of a very stiff curve at this point. And the video is in real time, so you can see that you could do this uh, decently uh, fast. Um, and um, this is the bone graph we get. So we get really good bone graph after putting in the bone mill. And as you can see, um, that, um, and that's the patient with the uh, pre op curve that you saw uh, quite flexible at this point. So we don't have to do any more releases. Um, I use an iron bender so I don't notch my. Uh, rod, and, and I know there are different preferences for this, but um, uh, that's how I like uh, bending my rods. And then as um, you see after we, I, I use all the towers on the screws that I have and the thought process behind that is to um, get multiple points of fixation for the correction. Um, and I start with a concavity um, and um, I have a good amount of uh, kyphosis uh, and um, at that point, we um, capture the rod and uh, pay attention to that yellow arrow. There's a, a hex wrench, and that's how I control the rotation of the rod. So um, it's not a pure rod rotation technique, um, but uh, some the, the, the rod goes at an angle, and then uh, we are able to slightly derotate it. And then um, the assistant is holding the um, rotation of the rod, as you can see, um, <clears throat> with the wrench. Um, and then uh, we uh, start tightening and coming slowly to the apex and um, slowly pulling the apex of the curve up to the rod with the rod in the correct orientation uh, in the sagittal plane. Um, and um, I think one of the um, most dangerous parts of a case for me has been uh, handing the final tightener to uh, my assistant. So 
now we just final time right over the towers with the caps in there so we don't have to introduce any um, instruments into the uh, open um, uh, spinal canal and then that's what it looks like at the end. Um, rarely we do uh, compression distraction techniques or uh, some uh, in situ bending. And um, if you look at the rib cage and the trunk shift uh, post-op, you can see you have improvement. Uh, shoulders aren't perfect, but perhaps if I went one more level up, I could um, get that a little bit um, get the shoulders a little bit more level uh, or maybe sacrifice a little bit of correction in that thoracic. But uh, clinically, she looks pretty level. And um, also the um, rib hump is gone with uh, uh, no thoracoplasty. This is another example. Um, uh, this one uh, is a little bit different just because this is more of a kyphoscoliosis. So usually in kyphoscoliosis, I um, try to get an MRI on all those patients. Um, and you can see there's a compensatory hyperlordosis in this patient. And uh, when you address the um, <coughs> kyphosis and correct that, um, the, uh, the lordosis actually corrects as well. And um, um, so um, I don't know if, about your guys' institution, but we were part of the setting scoliosis straight. Um, so our data is collected uh, against other surgeons, so you can kind of benchmark yourself how you're doing. And uh, with this technique, uh, we get pretty good um, uh, correction um, uh, of the Cobb angle. Um, and um, also, uh, we could look at how much kyphosis we create. And uh, in our group, we're pretty good at increasing that kyphosis uh, rather than keeping it um, So we talked a little bit about planning of the levels, uh, release osteotomies, um, bringing the coronal sagittal plane, and then also um, uh, derotating and uh, getting um, axial correction and why that might be important. Thank you. Great talk. Um, when, for your bigger curves, when you are, um, trying to balance the goals of a three-dimensional correction, the rotation, creating sagittal plane kyphosis, um, and, and the coronal correction. If, if there's one, if you were to kind of prioritize the importance of the three, um, if you were getting motor change or something, that had to sacrifice one of those planes, what, what is your kind of thought process with that? Uh, great question. I think, um, this sagittal plane probably is the most important. Um, I think leaving a little bit of coronal curve um, should be should be fine. Mm -hmm. And in the larger curves, again, when we do get the curve coronally corrected, um, uh, it actually throws off the shoulder balance a little bit. Um, and um, also, uh, we see a little bit of increase in uh, neuromonitoring changes, um, even though they almost always come back uh, by just, uh, again, uh, increasing the pressures and lightening the anesthetic. Um, Thanks for the talk, Ishar. It's all felt very familiar. Um, you showed that curve that was about 100 degrees and you stopped at L3 and, I mean, you knocked it out of the park and got the, uh, the disc very level, but. I feel like one of the most challenging things with the bigger curves when you're stopping at L3 is to get the end plates parallel. And uh, I just wondered if you had any tips or tricks. I mean, obviously try to get that parallel introp while the patient's laying on the table, but is there anything that you particularly pay attention to to try to get that right? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think um, just, just simple things, for example, making sure you do a good release at that last level um, uh, and uh, you can probably do a little bit more of an extended release. I do get a, a fluoro shot, um, an AP fluoro shot, and uh, make sure that I have gotten that um, parallel. So just paying attention to it. And um, I might go back and uh, just derotate against the uh, last level uh, individually. Even though I've done that less and less, uh, it might be somewhere where you pay a little bit of extra attention and uh, derotate against that. And in the bigger curves, um, also when you're picking your levels, um, I, I would probably say that I've gone away from trying to cheat a level. So 
if uh, the last touch is barely touching a level, it's not very um, um, parallel in the pre-op, um, I think just going to the safer verba is uh, probably advantageous. So I don't really try to uh, cheat one up. Um, I think that's also important. Nice talk, nice cases. You, um, in my practice, I use anterior releases sometimes, you know, thoracoscopically formed, you keep the patient prone and uh, CO2 is inflation between two ports. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very good to get into it. Particularly in uh, the larger, stiffer curves, like probably something like this, I would uh, use that as well as the frankly word out of spine, because you can shorten the anterior column better that way. A great question. So I actually, I, I trained with Manish Gupta, who is a big anterior release guy. And I found myself, uh, I have a couple of very similar size and uh, shaped curves with the same flexibility. And um, I um, did an anterior release um, on them. Um, I'll be to open anterior release um, and then did the posterior and then uh, slowly I've come away from them and um, honestly again 100 degree curve you know we get it pretty straight um, and uh, I really don't see a big role for an anterior release um, I have a couple of very very large curves almost 180 degrees um, that um, um, I'm actually doing next week. But in those curves, we usually put them in halo, uh, uh, halo gravity traction for about six to eight weeks. So the curve becomes 180 degree curves becomes a hundred degree curve anyways. And um, in a lot of those, the spine is very, very rotated. Um, so um, I don't know if this is off label or I shouldn't talk about it, but I actually do a um, disc release posteriorly of the anterior discs. So in the, in the apical portion of the spine, the spinal cord um, is completely um, uh, drifted towards the um, concavity, con concave pedicle. So on the other side, the spine's completely rotated. So I take the SAP and I take some T-lift shavers and I actually um, do three, four level anterior release just from the posterior spine. Uh, obviously it's a little dangerous because you're working by the cord. Um, but it works wonderfully. Um, and then obviously if it's bigger, I just go to a VCR at that point. So um, really at this point, I, I don't have a big role for anterior release in these patients.